thank you very much, uh, the organizer, for inviting me. This is a fantastic conference. I really have been enjoying. And I'm the one staying between you and lunch, so I'm going to try to uh, stay on time. And uh, first, I wanted to, I couldn't resist to also show nice movies. So uh, there's a beautiful movie by Howard Berg, who passed away actually this year, so that's a sad aspect of it. But he's an amazing scientist. If you don't know about him, you should check out his name, and you'll see it's something out of this world. And uh, so I'm going to talk about those bacteria that have flagella, the E. coli, and they move straight and then change direction. And uh, the skull runs on tumble. And in my life, my, my, my lab, we're also interested in studying uh, fly olfaction and olfactory navigation. And the reason we study this system is because we're interested in computation and how they are implemented uh, by biological system uh, from molecules all the way to behavior. And one of the things that we're very interested in is what is the role of fluctuation and variation uh, in those computations. And so today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on, on this role of variation. By the way, those flies, this is one of the first experiments where the, the signal could be seen because we discovered the fruit flies like smoke. And so they are walking between two plates, and uh, we can image the signal and, and, and fly. OK, so the question for today is that cells uh, tend to do collective behavior, and we heard a lot about that yesterday, and also tend to have phenotypic diversity. And uh, the both very important trait for cells, uh, the advantages for many reasons. Um, and uh, for example, phenotypic diversity is useful when the population encounters uh, unexpected environment. If one cell survives, that will cause uh, the genome to keep on. So I'm going to talk about isogenic populations. So in this whole talk, there will be no differences in, 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 in genome between the individual cells. And so if you have collective migration, you can ask, how is it that you can have both collective migration and diversity? Because collective migration requires some sort of coordination, but phenotypic diversity is about being different and not following the rule. You know? And so there's a tension between collective behavior and diversity that's always there in all cell populations. And we want to understand uh, how biological system managed to, to resolve that tension. And so, uh, what are the mechanisms or strategies that enable those groups or cells to balance diversity and collective migration? And this work has been done by a series of very talented postdocs who they have faculty position. He went to the banking industry, unfortunately. He just got a, a faculty at position at the Simons Institute in New York. So uh, this is a long series of people who, who work on this. this this work on this, this subject. So bacteria, uh, E. coli in this case, can migrate collectively. And we saw yesterday in the first talk how that's done, but not with bacteria yesterday, but here's bacteria. So they are eating aspartate. So they're in the world, in the front of them, there's a uniform concentration of aspartate. They're consuming it, and behind them, there's no more aspartate. So between the two, the front and the back of that group, there's a gradient that they can sense, and they follow that gradient that they themselves are uh, creating. And this is known since a very long time that this is happening. And, uh, but what's interesting, if you take those cells and you wash away the nutrient, and then you suspend the cells into a motility buffer, what will happen is that the cell cycle will arrest. And then the cell, for about an hour, an hour and a half, will basically swim around trying to find a better life. And the statistics of the behavior at the single cell level will be stable. There will be fluctuation, but the statistics of the fluctuation will be stable. And what's important is that you realize then that if you track individual cells, that there's huge differences in the way those isogenic, identical, at the level of genetics cells uh, explore space. And you can quantify these differences by just measuring, detecting when the cells are uh, generating those abrupt change of direction, those tumbles. And so then for one of those trajectory, you can measure what's the average probability to change direction, the tumble bias. And you find that the population, there's a very wide distribution of this tumble bias, with some cells tumbling only like 1% of the time and others 50% of the time. So the question then is, 
where does the first thing I'm going to talk about is where do these differences come from? But in general, how can you have so much diversity and also do this collective behavior I was just showing you? No? So where do they come from? So I had this very talented postdoc who decided he wanted to see if there's a direct relationship between the tumble bias and the actual protein level of expression in individual cells, which is very hard to do because you have to track cells over millimeters. But to measure protein concentration, you have to have a 100x, and the cell has to be basically stuck to a glass. No? So what he came up with is that he put those cells into a preparation that had PEG deacrylate, so a polymer with a, a, a reactive end, and a photo initiator. And so then he can track the cells of the swim, and then you flash UV, and very rapidly, all of the cell, the, the thing becomes a gel, and the cells get caught into wherever position they are. And then you switch to 100x, and you can measure protein content. And so with this, he could relate the trajectory to the actual counting the protein inside the single cells. And that's what he found. There was a huge amount of variability from single cell. Each dot is a single cell. But now if you, for example, take an area here and measure what's the average tumble bias as a function of the key R and key B protein counter number that he measured, you find that there is regularity. So basically what you see is that the ratio between those two protein expression level will control this tumble bias. And we actually already knew this because key R tend to activate and key B tend to deactivate the signaling pathway in this case. Another thing that's interesting is you can also measure the variance of the distribution as a function of the expression level of those two proteins. And you find that the variance depends more on key B expression than key R. So this is interesting to us because it means that uh, in an isogenic population, if you have point mutation, for example, at uh, the regulatory element of two genes, you can change both the mean and the shape of the distribution of phenotypic diversity. Okay. So next, what is the consequences of those differences? So I showed you that you have differences in protein that give you different in phenotype. So now you have different phenotype. What's the differences in their, func in, in their capability to climb gradient? So we want to relate phenotype to performance. And so what we did is that we built a, an, an, an a gradient that is static, uh, and it's composed of uh, amino acid, uh, uh, analog, methyl aspartate, that the cells cannot consume. So this, this, this gradient is, is, is constant. You load the cells behind a barrier, and then you ask, can, if, if you can track the different individual cells, you can find the tumble bias. And so you want to know how fast are the cells in this bin climbing the gradient compared to these ones, for example. And so you let the cells go, and you take the microscope, you take a movie here, then you move the stage, take a movie there, and so on, and then back and back and so on. So at every position, you have movies, which means you can extract the tumble bias from the movies, and you have position. And the result is that there's huge differences in performances between the different uh, isogenic cells. So if you have a low tumble bias cells, you climb the gradient much faster. Uh, in 15 minutes, where like this guy would take like an hour to do the same distance, on average. So those are averages. By the way, the lines here, the colored line, are prediction from a mathematical model that has all the parameters fixed. So all of the signal transduction parameters are fixed. And the only thing that we did is generate a phenotypic uh, variability in gene expression. And there's only two parameters, which is the mean level of expression and the variance of the expression level of the protein. That's it. And with this, you can fit all the, all the data set. The black line is the average population performance. So now. Can you shape this distribution? Can you establish a causal relationship between protein level and the performance? So we can go and manipulate one of the protein in this signaling pathway. For example, this one, uh, it's a methyl transferase that mediate adaptation. And so depending on the level of expression of this protein, I can make a, a population that look like the wild type I had, or one that has many more cells that are on the low tumble bias regime. And the prediction from the model is that Actually, if you could go even lower, you go even faster before, if you, if before then the performance will collapse. Because if you don't tumble, you don't go anywhere. No? So you have to tumble. But in liquid, the prediction from the theory that we wrote in the previous paper is that you're going to climb fastest if you tumble the least possible. 
And so you can test this prediction, and effectively you find that you can actually get this bin here, where you have cells that tumble only 1% of the time, is even much faster. But you see that if you don't tumble, then the performance collapse. So then this data set gives you something that you can do, you can do something very interesting, which is you have a map from phenotype to performance here. So if you plot this map, you get here the phenotype, and here the performance, the distance past the gate. And the different curves are for different time points in the experiment. And you see that the very fast one seems to be slowing down. This is an artifact of the experiment that the chamber we have is only 10 millimeter long. And so those cells, this is the average position, but you already have individual cells that have reached the end of the, of, of the device. No, that's why it's slowing down. But so now you can ask, how is the average population performance how does it compare with the performance of the average individual within this population? And I remind you that these experiments were made, were, were carried out with a very low dilution of cells. There's no interaction between cells whatsoever in this experiment. The gradient is static, constant. The cells are, the cell cycle is arrested. Everything is kind of very at steady state, no? So we're just taking an average, and since this distribution is in the linear region of this mapping from phenotype to performance, you take a convolution between this, you find that the mean performance of the group, the mean speed of the cells, is the same as the speed of the mean phenotype. But for this distribution, this is not going to be the case at all. The mean performance of the group is much higher than the performance of its mean phenotype, just because of the statistics and the nonlinearity of the mapping of from phenotype to performance. So this means that whenever you measure the behavior of a population, isogenic population, you can have huge differences in performance just because of the shape of the distribution. And so this is my first takeaway for you to, to take with you, is that in biology, you have um, always a population of cells that carry out function, not like a single cell. You have a group of cells that express the same genes. And because uh, you have variation in the expression level of protein, you can have distribution of protein abundances, phenotype, and functional performances. And the shape of those distribution affects the average performance because you have nonlinearity in this mapping from protein to phenotype to performance and gen sense inequality. No? And so the entire shape of the distribution is most likely under selection, not just its mean. And I keep, I keep on repeating this, but you know, it gets people forget. But it's, I think it's very important because it's very, very basic. This is about the most basic experiment you could do. No, there's no interaction between cell whatsoever. Okay, so now, what about collective behavior? What's funny is that these cells can do this collective behavior, but at the same time they have all this diversity. So is this possible? And if you look at the speed of the cells, you see that they're moving at a constant speed. And so how can you have a constant migra coherent migration of cells when you have individuals that are like much faster than others in the same group? So the first question we ask is, who is in this group? Are they all phenotype? Or the collective behavior will tend to you know, select out some of the phenotype? So for that, you can do the following experiment. You can actually trap the group and then let it spread out so it's not anymore in this nonlinear wave dynamics, no? And then you track the individual cells here, and you can determine the phenotype of the individual that traveled together. And what you find is very interesting. So the black curve here is the distribution of phenotype that was introduced inside the device. And in red is the distribution of phenotype that did travel in this first group. And you see that the higher tumble by our cells, which were the lowest, the, the slowest in this static gradient before, they, they got kind of eliminated. They fell off the wagon. They were not able to keep up with the group. No? And what's interesting is that this is not a genetic difference. It's only due to this collective behavior. If when the cells are here, I perfuse this and I provide nutrient and let them grow again, I should go from this distribution back to the black distribution. And this is exactly what happened. So here, the blue one is the same as the red one and comes back to the black distribution, which is the one that was introduced. Okay? You see also it takes a few generations, which means there's inheritance of phenotypes from mother to daughter cell, which will become important later. Okay, so 
what's the mechanism for them to travel together? So you can do a little bit of math, and this is the bacterial chemotaxis system. So because of Howard Berg and many others, we know pretty much everything in terms of the molecular mechanism and the parameters on the system. So we know that they sense the logarithm, the log sensing, and if the concentration of aspartate is A, we know the binding constant. Uh, this is basically the cooperativity in the cluster of receptors. And so this, if you want, is the perceived signal that the cells are experiencing as they're traveling. And if you sit into the moving reference frame, you can ask, where is the phenotype, let's say, number one? You know? So the phenotype one to move with the group has to move with the group speed C. So this is going to be the flux of those cells. And that flux is basically the chemotactic flux minus the diffusive flux. And the chemotactic flux has this chemotactic coefficient, which is this performance that I was measuring before in this static gradient. And it's multiplying the slope of the gradient. And then here you have your, diff your diffusion. So if you look at the peak, what's the position of the peak? And Z, by the way, is the co-moving frame coordinate. Okay? So you can take at the peak here, this derivative is 0, and you can remove the density. And you find that there's a rule that each phenotype has to follow in order to be in the group, which is that its chemotactic performance times the slope of the gradient at its position have to be matching the group speed. That means that if you have a high chi, you're going to tend to move towards the front, but it's becoming harder and harder to swim to navigate here because the gradient is becoming shallower. If you're a weaker guy, you're going to fall back, but then it's becoming easier. And so you're going to be located here. So in order to travel together, what's going to happen is that the cells will basically spontaneously sort, organize themselves within this uh, group, migrating group. And you should see that organization uh, in experiment. OK, so you can take, again, this system. And this time, we're going to modify the level of expression of key Z here, which is a phosphatase. And if you modify this level, you can change the distribution of tumble bias from this one, which is more at the low end, or this one, which is more the high tumble bias cell. And so if what I said before is true, if you mix the red and the blue one, they should migrate together. But the red should be in the front, because they have low tumble bias, and they're faster. And the blue one should be in the back. And this is exactly what you see. So this shows you that those classic keller segal waves, the Julius Adler thing that you see on the plate, they're actually organized within this front. There's a structure that is organized by the ability of the individual cells. And the, 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 the higher the performance, the more in the front you're going to be. But there, it's more difficult to navigate because the gradient is becoming shallow. No? And you can uh, look at the density profile of those. So this is the density profile of the whole population. So you see that clearly there is a difference in the position of the peak between this phenotype and this phenotype. And then the distance between the peak should depend on the distance in phenotypic space. So if I do the same with the purple and the green, they should be closer to each other, and they are. And then you can do for many pairs, you see that the difference in mean tumble bias determine the distance, the relative distance within the group. No? And these positions are actually pretty stable. You can see it here. Those are like the peak position for this, this different population. So the migrating band are structured. So now, so far, what I told you is that you have this spontaneous reorganization that happened uh, that basically help maintain some sort of diversity and travel together. No? But this also has a consequence, which is that the cells that are very much at the back, they have a higher, they have a higher chance to fall off. No? So you're going to have a slow leakage of those cells that are the weakest at the back. So now if you travel for a very long time in the same uniform environment, and you don't have any growth, because this experiment is performed in, a, in an environment where the cell cycle is arrested, slowly you're going to start to lose the blue guys there. No? And then eventually, you're going to lose diversity in the cell, in the population. So collective migration will tend to eliminate diversity slowly. So the question is, can migrating population benefit from diversity? And uh, what you have to think about is that navigating in liquid is not all what those cells do. So whenever you start to navigate through different environments, 
who is best at navigating will be a different phenotype. So if you, if you navigate, for example, through agarose, uh, you can have this kind of meshing structure with a certain uh, you know, chord length. And the, that length scale will be very important. If you tend to swim much longer than that length scale, you're going to get stuck, and you're going to need to wait until you tumble in order to continue. And so it's known that in this type of environment, having a higher tumble bias is better to spread, for example, on plates. And so you have, this is the tumble bias, I was showing you before that in liquid, you want to tumble almost never. And then actually, this curve is really well reproduced by the experiment in liquid. But in agar, it's probably going to be something like that. And so the best position will be here, the optimal tumble bias, which is quite different. You know? So then from here on, all the rest of my talk is just theory. So what we want is understanding how basically the population will deal with this different environment. What happens when the migrating population encounter a new environment? And so uh, the, the performance is environment dependent, and the organization, the, pro, the, 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 the prediction is that the organization will depend on this environment. So if you are in the agar, you're basically going to have those cells being more in the front, where, like in, in uh, liquid, those cells will be more in the front. No? So to test this, this idea or this hypothesis, we build this mathematical model, which is like a Keller-Siegel model, but augmented with two things. One is that the coefficient here are a function of tumble bias, and so we have a distribution of tumble bias that you have to integrate over uh, when, when you calculate, for example, the consumption rate and so on. And then also there is a growth rate, and the growth rate, the, do, the, the growth rate the, the production of a daughter cell with this tumble bias is conditional on the tumble bias of the mother cell, no? this inheritance. And so if you uh, take this model and you can solve analytically part of it or you run simulations, what you find is that if you start with this distribution over time, in liquid, you're going to basically move the tumble bias distribution more and more towards low tumble bias cells. But when you have the same system moving through uh, the a model agar, basically you see that the distribution is shifting to the right. And so the migrating population is actually selecting its own phenotype by just moving and removing the one that are not useful in current environment, which is very interesting because that suggests that it might be possible for them to use that as an adaptation uh, approach for the new environment. But how does this loss of cells that are lost at the back balance with growth in the long term? So now if you add growth to the system, and we're going to make it very simple, we're going to assume that the growth rate is the same for all cells. And in an experiment, you can more or less do that by basically saturating the environment with nutrients. So everywhere the cells are growing. It doesn't depend on where they are. But what's important is the probability that the daughter cells have a given phenotype given that the mother cells have a phenotype. And so an important parameter is going to be the correlation between mother and daughter cells or the inheritance of the phenotype. Okay? And so now, if you redo the following thing, you see that the population, as they're traveling through uniform environment, in liquid or in porous liquid, the shift in the Population composition depends on your inheritance. The higher the inheritance, the more you're going to lose diversity and uh, basically have a population that becomes, at steady state, almost like a delta function. No? You're going to eliminate all of the, the phenotype. Because what's happened is the ones that are in the front, they're going to generate cells that are almost identical to themselves. So over, over time, basically, there will be only those cells left if inheritance is very high. If inheritance is less, then you maintain diversity in both cases. No? Mm -hmm. Also, what you see is that as inheritance increases, the speed of the group increases. So you're improving performances. No? And that's no wonder, because you're getting more and more of the cells that are like good at navigating a particular environment. So the selection and growth is non-genetically adapting the group composition to the environment. There is no, in this model, there is no gene expression. There is no regulatory mechanism. There is no sensing the environment and expressing something new. 
is just based on the fact that you have diversity and the collective behavior removes who is not as good, uh, not, not the best in this current environment. And then what happened when you encounter a new environment? You could ask yourself, well, why would the population not just always have maximum inheritance? The problem is that if you have maximum inheritance, when you hit a new environment, it's going to take a very long time to get the cells that you need to be the new leader in that new environment. So there's a trade-off between how fast you migrate in a uniform environment versus how fast you can adapt to the new environment. And so now you can, so higher inheritance will mean that you have more division are needed to produce the new phenotype you need. No? So then, this is my last slide, is what happens if you have this alternating environment? What you can intuit from this is that there should be some sort of relationship between the degree of inheritance, the amount of variability, and the statistics of new environment that you encounter. So here we made it very simple. We consider time duration in different environments that are given by this big time t. And then we measuring uh, in units of the doubling time of the population uh, what is happening. So we're measuring the speed of the diverse population uh, normalized by the speed of a population that would have only the generalist, the mean phenotype. No? And so you see that uh, if the environmental duration is very short, basically you don't want to have a lot of diversity and you want to have a lot of inheritance basically because what's happening is that you don't want a lot of shift in this because you don't have the time to adapt because the environment is too short. No? But as the environment becomes longer, you see that at some point it becomes much, it's going better to have uh, diversity and also that the degree of inheritance needs to, can, can increase, but not become maximum. You see, you don't go up to that corner. And so you see that in this region, now the population are able to basically switch distribution of phenotype as they encounter the new environment. No? OK, so this is, this is a just got accepted in, in PNF, this, this piece of theory. OK, so that's my second takeaway from this talk, is that an isogenic population, you really should think about it as a multicellular system. You know, the, all the cells have the same genome. The genome doesn't care that a cell will die. It just cares about surviving. So one cell survives, then it's good. No? And that's what makes it so robust and, and powerful. Then individuality and collective behavior are intention. And because of that, when you have collective behavior, you get this spatial sorting, but also that kind of removal of the weakest phenotype from your population. No? And, uh, but this is environment dependent. Because who is best depends what environment you're navigating. And yesterday we saw those cells that um, in the immune system, for example, that navigate all sorts of different environments. No? So you can think about also what's the role of diversity in these types of, of populations. And then non-genetic inheritance will control the trade-off, the time scale that it takes to adapt to the new environment versus how quick you are, how efficient you are in a given environment. So you have to trade those two things. And then you can ex I think this concept to generalize to many other collective behavior because in this really there's a super basic ingredient no it's just there's some sort of cue that is generated by the system and then the individual cell have different performances following that cue which create this spatial organization and that's it that you have you don't have anything else and it's interesting that you have almost all the hallmark of you know genetic adaptation, like evolution, but no mutation. You do have change in the distribution over time of the phenotypic composition of the group that migrating, but without mutation. OK, so this is what I wanted to tell you. Uh, thank you again for your attention. Ready to take questions.